students need not just to learn, but to learn how to learn. Education must come by knowledge, like the things in critics, to include information on sustainability and the climate emergency, and to advance gender equality, human rights, and the cultural needs. Indeed, education is one of our most powerful tools to achieve the sustainable development goals and build the future of the world. I wish you every success with this new initiative, and I thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank the Excellency the President of the and the Chair of the International Commission for leading this important work on the future of education. The world today faces a learning process. What kinds of futures do we want to shape? escape from you. So, good afternoon, good afternoon, excellencies, dear guests, please take a seat, we can start. My name is Stefania Giannini, I'm Assistant Director General for Education at UNESCO, and uh, I would like to warmly welcome all of you today at this uh, exciting event. We are discussing about the futures of education, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to welcome all of you and being with us today. Let me begin by giving uh, the floor to Madame Audrey Azoulay, Director General of UNESCO, 
I should say, whose uh, personal passion, uh, energy has led uh, to this uh, new initiative uh, that you are launching today in the UN. And uh, it's about uh, rethinking education. Uh, it's about uh, looking at the future through the UK education lens. Please, Madame Azoulay, the floor is yours. Merci, Stefania. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the heads of state and uh, government, uh, uh, ministers, uh, excellences, ladies and gentlemen, uh, representatives of the young people and civil society and teachers, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to uh, to give you the welcome you here to this event uh, dedicated to the future of education. Education is not only something that has to do with dignity and human rights, but it is also the uh, strongest weapon to change the world, to take the famous words of Madiba, Nelson Mandela. But, uh, in order to cite somebody else, if we teach uh, today the way we did before, we uh, steal the future from our children. Those are the words of uh, philosopher and pedagogue John Dewey, which was uh, uh, asking us to revise education in the light of our time. Each state, uh, question the ones here and the ones which are not here, everybody questions himself, herself on the evolution to give to educational policy uh, when the world our world uh, meeting challenges which are different from those of the preceding generation and the uncertainty of the transformation of the world, uh, questions uh, school problems, methods, uh, teaching methods, as well as uh, learning places. The technological disruption with its enormous potential, but also its ethical and uh, challenges and inequalities, the consequences of the omnipresence of technology on the capacity of attention and learning, the massive uh, displacement of population and of societies that are more diverse and interconnected, the vulnerability of the planet and the resources and solutions which we are depleting and persistent inequalities as well as the difficult transformation uh, of uh, uh, where it's difficult to anticipate uh, jobs. That imposes us to rethink education, even though we have not uh, re resolved all the problems of the present problem. The question of access to education has not been resolved. The quality of learning has not been resolved either. We know that many children who go to school don't learn well. We also know that the girls are often absent from school and don't uh, stay enough, enough time in school in several countries and don't have access to all areas areas of learning like science. Uh, at the same time, uh, from all these revolutions, there are the progresses of cognitive sciences that give us a new angle of analysis on the process, on learning process. On this debate, which is fundamental for the future of our societies, UNESCO, in charge of uh, piloting and coordinate the agenda of Education 2030 of the UN, wishes to accompany and support the member states at this time of uh, profound change. And this to, that will condition the future of our society. And we wish to do this uh, from our uh, point of view, uh, from a very uh, humanist uh, perspective that does not reduce education to a technical or technological issue or economical issue. It is from this DNA, a very strong DNA that we need, uh, that, that we are very proud of, and uh, that is marked by milestones on uh, educational policies, uh, literacy campaigns from the beginning of the UNESCO, and the big reports that uh, formed uh, education, like the Four Report of 1972 or the Delo Report of 1996, uh, to the uh, world uh, development that led to the ODD number four. So we wish today to open a new page in this history to uh, respond to the needs of our member states uh, in conformity with the desires of our governance bodies. This project, which is that of a world conversation and of a report on the future of education, mobilizes uh, many ways of learning with uh, vision towards the future rooted in the values of human rights at the service of everybody's dignity. Education for sustainable development, citizenship, learning, knowledge, skills for work, public teaching, place of the higher education, 
uh, several thematic approaches are opened and that can uh, be transversal, transversal in, with other areas like uh, gender equality in education. This report, this conversion, will be based on a platform of consultations and world-scale debates to mobilize uh, collective intelligence and share the best international experiences, learn from uh, lessons from experiments and research. And I think that this mobilization process is very important, is as important as the result or conclusions that we uh, that will be the outcome, ladies, mesdames, and messieurs. To this process of consultations, uh, the report can also benefit from UNESCO's expertise, uh, normative, intellectual, and operational. <laughs> I refer to the initiative that we're un undertaking in close collaborations with governments, such as the development of standard setting norms or training of decision makers in education policy. I refer also to UNESCO's fieldwork, which leads teachers across countries, which trains uh, education, and for instance, for climate action, or uh, supports education in emergency and post-conflict situations. We can also count on the support of the UNESCO university chairs. And I'm glad uh, to, to, to know that more than 200 of those university chairs have already been mobilized and sent first contribution to start uh, this uh, conversation on the future of education. I would like to thank very particularly Portugal and its president uh, here present for having been at the origin of this very idea and having strongly contributed to the organization of this side event. I would like to express my warm thanks to the members of the International Commission who have agreed to carry out this very ambitious task, and some of whom we have the honor of having among us today. And I would like very particularly to thank you, Madam President of Ethiopia, because I'm very happy to announce that you've accepted to serve as the Commission's Chair, along with your other very important uh, major responsibilities in a country, in a country which is uh, undertaking profound major changes and uh, which believes that, you need, that uh, education is at the root of those changes. I am very grateful to you, to the heads of states present here with us, and I think that someone else would like, Madam, also to join us today and to thank you if we can send its message, his message. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I thank Her Excellency, the President of Ethiopia and Chair of the International Commission, for leading this important work on the future of education. The world today faces a learning crisis. Too often, young people are not too well equipped with the knowledge they need to navigate the technological revolution. Today and for the future, students need not just to learn, but to learn how to learn. Education must combine knowledge, life skills, and critical thinking. It should include information on sustainability and the climate emergency, and it should advance gender equality, human rights, and the culture of peace. Indeed, education is one of our most powerful tools to achieve the sustainable development goals and build the future we want. I wish you every success with this new initiative, and I thank you. Well, the future is important to all of us, but it's particularly important for youth. Youth who are not uh, waiting for the world that we are going to, to live for them. And we heard their voices uh, around uh, uh, these buildings uh, this week. So today we start, before hearing from anyone else, with you, uh, you speakers who will offer reflection and their messages to all of us on how we should reimagine and rethink education. First, allow me to introduce Ms. Uh, Akosea uh, Apon from Ghana, who uses her counseling skills to champion girls' education.
Your Excellencies, Madame Azoulay, ladies and gentlemen, it is my utmost pleasure to be part of this conversation about the futures of education, especially because for the basic skills of reading, writing, and critical thinking, we have all come different pathways and different journeys in our respective careers, and we are all here today. We have the opportunity to dialogue on how to make such skills, and even more, available and accessible to young people everywhere, using contextually relevant but future-oriented means to prepare today's generation for tomorrow's world. In reimagining education, ladies and gentlemen, we have to dream creatively. And I dare say we have perfected the means of inspiring young people like me to reach for the stars. But let us not be fast to forget the circumstances that some young people find themselves in. The long journeys that they have to take to reach those dreams and aspirations that they reach out for. Aspirations that are limited by poverty and negative socioeconomic outcomes, especially in developing settings. In such contexts, ladies and gentlemen, access to education, the delivery of education, and the safety of school children has many challenges. To provoke solutions to climate change, environmental pollution, poor reproductive health outcomes, and the overall achievement of the sustainable development goals, we need to transform such realities, and we need to do so now. In the spirit of global inclusiveness, the discourse on gender equality cannot be excluded, especially the education of women and girls. I'm not, talking about, I'm not just talking about sending the girl child to school. We need to start reimagining education for the teenaged mother for the pregnant girl, for the girl living with disability, and for the girl that has just been sexually abused. We need to approach these challenges with tact, specificity, and awareness of the context within which they occur. I strongly welcome this initiative to think about future transformations, but we mustn't forget that these transformations need to begin in the realities of today, and they need to begin now. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you so much, Akosia. And now let's hear from Robert Napier. Please, Robert, from Malta, is a student leader and uh, currently also president of the European uh, uh, Student Association. Please. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it is a true honor and a privilege to be speaking amongst world leaders of today and tomorrow who have the power to implement a change. A change that can be positive or negative, and you need to make this decision. Amidst all that is happening in the world around us, we have a duty to think ahead and to shape the education of the future. As I enter my last years of student representations, I feel worried. I'm worried because whilst massive progress has been made, we are still not ready for what's to come. And there are two things that I would like to emphasize in this regard. Firstly, the issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And secondly, the issue of sustainability. Investing in these two areas is exactly what we need in order to be ready for what's to come. It is a known fact that children who lack the basic skills and education are less equipped for the changes that are happening in the labor market at the moment. This is why all of you here have a crucial role to play in improving the quality of early childhood education, to ensure that no child is enslaved or forced into the labor market rather than into education. Remember that the quality of education increases with diversity, and all of you in here have a crucial role to foster equity and inclusion if you want your communities to strive now and in the future. Secondly, remember that none of us can exist if we continue to ruin the world that we are living in. My generation is naturally more scared than you are 
because we have a longer future ahead of us. So please bear this in mind. And bear in mind that sustainability needs to be embedded in our education systems, from early childhood all the way into higher education. This is the only thing we know for a fact that is needed to have a future. So please make sure to secure a place within your education policies and within your education systems and leave us a place to call home. Leave us a planet to lead in the future and leave us an educated and sustainable community. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Robert. We'll keep in mind, and we are honored today to have uh, um, Her Excellency Ms. Uh, Saleh Work Zude, President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and I should say also a long-term friend to UNESCO and the United Nations and Chair of the International Commission. Please. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, Madam Director General of UNESCO, rep youth representatives, and student union representatives, ladies and gentlemen. Envisioning and strategizing on what should be the role and purposes of education. This new initiative brings to brings that global intellectual leadership in our new era. As we face the profound challenges and existing opportunities before us, we have a deep obligation to listen to children and youth and fully involve them in decisions about the future of our shared planet. It is through knowledge and learning we reach across generation. Through knowledge and learning, we reach backwards to draw on the wisdom of previous generations. Through knowledge and learning, we reach forwards to inspire and find inspiration in the hopes, dreams, and plans of future generations. I'm very glad that there will be a strong African voice in these discussions on the futures of education. In our day and age, no longer do we allow the future of the planet to be dictated from one location. Futures must be locally and democratically envisioned. After all, it's only through collective and local actions that the futures we want can be made. The vi vision of this initiative is that by thinking together, we can act together to make the futures we want. We know now that there will be an international commission charged with rethinking the ways knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. Yes, yet our success will rest on the inputs and involvement of people from around the globe at all levels, from the youngest children to the widest professors, from parents and teachers to leaders in civil society and governments. While climate change, poverty, hunger, violence, marginalization and extremism present deep challenges, we also have much to be proud of, much that can provide inspiration and help us reimagine education for the future. We can welcome the changing perceptions on the education of girls and women. We can welcome the centrality of education as a public service and a public good. We can welcome the mobilization of communities to steward national resources. We can welcome the skills development of youth and the entrepreneurship and innovation that young people bring to economies and societies around the world. Yet we face the dual challenge of dealing with pressing present demands, as the DG has just mentioned, and also looking forward a future where things become less clear and where we cannot be certain that the learning and knowledge that is relevant today will be relevant in one or two decades. As we plan and design education for the future, we, may, we must make it adaptable and we must keep adapting it. Yet, at the same time, we must have an intent and a direction that guide us. UNESCO's new initiative asks us all to join together 
to rethink our strategies, our ways of teaching and learning, and the directions we are heading so that through education, we can shape the futures we want. It's a great honor for me to accept the invitation to chair the International <coughs> Commission on the Futures of Education. As chair of the commission, I pledge that broad consultation and inclusive dialogues will be the key features of our work. I thank you and I invite you all to join in this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And it's a pleasure for me to thank uh, our next speaker for his country sponsorship to this event, and giving the floor to uh, His Excellency Mr. Marcelo Rebelo de Souza, President of the Portuguese Republic. Ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, M Madam Director General, Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, has just encouraged us, us, all of us, UNESCO, all of us here together, also involving the young speakers whose remarks are so important on equality, on justice, on the future. And uh, I'll say to one of them, the last of them, anyhow, we are old, but you are not so young after all. My grandchildren are even younger. So things change so quickly that at the age of 20, one is already becoming too old. Well, but first of all, we must pay a tribute to the vision and determination of Director General Audrey Azoulay, who has taken the essential step of bringing UNESCO's role in these debates back to the center stage. Notre ambassador, Monsieur Sambadanovo. Uh, ambassador, uh, our ambassador tells us every day, every month, you're a true leader. The National Commission for the new report on the futures of education, learning to become, and for doing so on the occasion of the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly here in New York. We all remember the 72 learning to be report and the four basic assumptions of Edgar Faure when he wrote a letter to René Maheu First, how important it is, the international community. Second, education has the key for democracy. Third, the holistic development of every human being. Fourth, overall, lifelong education, providing knowledge that is permanently evolving and learning to be. <clears throat> but we also remember 98th report, learning the treasure within. And the four great challenges of education for the third millennium. Learning to know, learning to do, learning to live, and learning to be. The world has, meanwhile, undergone major changes in the last 21 years new dimensions of time and space, rapid and dramatic climate change, digital revolution with positive and negative aspects, changing demographics, different types of organization of work and community life, artificial intelligence, deepening of cultural, economic, social, and geopolitical polarizations, <clears throat> marked increases in selfishness, xenophobia, isolation, exacerbation of inequalities, 
fragmentation between human beings and inside each human being. Disruption concerning human beings and nature. But also many signs of hope. The fight for peace, for fraternity, for solidarity, and the role of youth and professor. And any professor for over 40 years knows that he is at the same time professor and student. We learn every year. Every year's new generation is different from the previous one. Different in ideas or different in the way of expressing the ideas. The ideas might be the same, but expression changes. Well, the problem is that throughout these 21, 21 years, UNESCO has seen other organizations and other fora take over its central role in research, reflection, debate, recommendations, mobilization. It is true that this has been the effect of well-accomplished changes in education in some countries. But it still invites us to revive the centrality of UNESCO. We know that the resources are not so many. We know it was a tough time. It still is a tough time. But, but we bet on your role, because it's our role. When we speak of UNESCO, we speak of the whole world. Even if it is the whole world, but one or but two, but three, but four, doesn't matter. They'll be back. They'll be back. <clears throat> By formulating a new utopia, a new ambition, a new dream, because that was one of the aims of UNESCO, to get to reach new dreams for the futures of education. And how happy is the idea, the idea of the futures of the education, not the future. There are different futures for education. In line, anyway, with the values and principles of the United Nations, with imagination and anticipation, we must imagine and we must anticipate, because here also we are a little bit late. To ensure that uh, UN values and principles stay alive and they have an appeal to younger generations and they can still shape the futures. This was, I'm sure, the intention of the Director General in launching this report, Learning to Become, which is more than learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, learning to be. It means, first of all, and the young speakers stressed it, having the opportunity to learn so many millions of people, not only young people, because learning is throughout the life. In universities, also in my university, I had plenty of people that they are no longer young people, but they are learning at the age of 60, 70, 80, 90, even 90. Well, having the opportunity to learn, which means going further in social, economic, and cultural equality in access to education. But it also means recreating oneself, remaking oneself. It means permanent redefinition redefin of the self. Portugal, Thanks 
and fully supports your vision of the future. Director General Audrey Azoulay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give the floor now to His Excellency, Mr. Ruman Radev, President of the Republic of Bulgaria. Now all you can see that I have a problem. It's always a challenge, huge challenge, to speak after my good friend, Marcelo Rebelo de Sos, the President of Portugal. But nevertheless, I will try, if you allow me, Mr. President. So, Madam Director General, colleagues, Excellencies, uh, I truly believe that this is the most important panel within this year, United Nations General Assembly. And <laughs> education means progress, peace, and sustainable development. That's why the problems of contemporary education and the vision of its development should take place high in the political leaders' agenda. And I would like to commend UNESCO and the Director General for organizing this forum. We, we can talk a lot about education, but today's education goes along with technology and science, composing together a very complex system of systems. And these systems, they shape up, shape up our future. However, we cannot hide universal problems behind contemporary education. The pace of change uh, the rise of new professions is so rapid that very often education lags behind the needs of real life, uh, the needs of uh, professions. That's why we need to get together experts in education, professors, scientists, psychologists even, and of course politicians, because at the final around politicians give the money. It is vitally important how and where to concentrate the money because resources are limited and it is extremely important to foresee the future and to rightly appoint our priorities. Uh, we, we talked today about transformation of uh, economy, however, we forget that it is absolutely impossible task if we are not able to transform education. We talked about social cohesion. However, what does it mean? It doesn't matter how much money we can spare and deliver and support many countries, many projects. The most important is to develop education in those countries. That's why we need to start talking about education and scientific cohesion. Uh, unless we stop concentrating the science and quality education only in a very narrow geographical framework, we will not be able to achieve decent equity, uh, and sustainable development at all. This is uh, mission impossible. In my personal experience, I have seen two main types of approach towards education. The first one is focusing on delivering, understanding, and memorizing ready-to-use knowledge. The second one, however, is focused mostly on developing critical and creative thinking. Which one is better, I don't know. You are the experts, you can determine the perfect balance 
this is what we need to do. However, uh, targeting the future, I think, critical and creating thinking should prevail because this is the way we can we can sense the future. And I will give you an example about the need of uh, scientific and educational cohesion in my country. The seven million Bulgaria competes with China, United States, and Russia in all, all the international high school Olympiads in mathematics, chemistry, physics, linguistics, and especially IT. We compete with those giants always for the top three places. This is the best achievement of my country. This is our national capital. And we are proud with this. However, what happens after the high school? Those talents, they need scientific infrastructure. They need top quality institutes. That, that means huge resources of the government. And they fly away looking for much, much better conditions. That's why we need to work for developing educational and scientific infrastructure spread equally in the world. Maybe this goal is achievable, maybe, if you persuade politicians to think from another vantage point at the problem. And Bulgaria is doing its best to work in this direction. We are the driving engine behind the idea of, uh, of establishing Southeast European Institute for Sustainable Technologies. I have discussed this with uh, Madame Azoulay. We have the support of the European Commission. And this institute will take together young people from all over the region and using in the best way European money and uh, EU uh, systems and uh, programs we have. Also, we take full advantage from uh, the European concept about open science and great programs we have here. We have Horizon 2020, we have Europe 2030 and uh, uh, we are very active in this. And as Marcelo said, education is opportunity. We have been trying in my country to provide this opportunity to each child, especially talking about inclusive edu education for uh, people with dis uh, children with disabilities. And of course, we are heavily working on dual education to help young people uh, to have early professional orientation and to take advantage and to encourage the business to work together with the government and education systems and uh, schools and universities to find the best solution for each child. And I will finish with, uh, again, I will cite uh, uh, Marcelo about anticipation. This is the most important. I will quote a notion from my previous profession. In the fighter pilot business, there is a notion which is a religion. It is called situational awareness. What does it mean? It means to have uh, receptors, to have sensors, and mental radar to scope and to scan the environment, to anticipate everything which is on the horizon. This is vitally important, to scan the future, because situational awareness is, puts clear line between life and death, between victory and defeat. I would see our education developing strong situational awareness about the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, and let me now give the floor to Her Excellency uh, Ms. Arna Sulberg, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Norway. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
Many years ago, the Norwegian author and Nobel laureate Sigrid Unset wrote, everything changes but the human heart. And as Unset made clear, the future may be uncertain and unfamiliar, but the experience of being human will, in essence, remain the same. We all want to belong, we want to feel the sense of purpose, and we want to learn. Today, the world is not on track to achieve SDG 4 on education. I therefore welcome the UNESCO initiative to reflect on how education can best serve humanity and the planet in the future. The world may be changing rapidly, but some things, like the importance of education, will remain the same. To achieve SDG 4 on education, we need to mobilize more international financing for global education. But countries must themselves invest in a higher share of their domestic resources in education. We also need to consider how these investments can be best and be most effective. In my view, there are three areas that we must focus on to make education fit for the future. First, we must ensure that everyone is included. We cannot speak about the future of education without mentioning those who are left behind. For example, only 2% of girls in the world's poorest countries attend upper secondary school. And more than 33 million children living with disabilities are out of school. And everyone has a right to education. Secondly, we must address the learning crisis and the barriers to learning. We must ensure that there are more and better teachers. We must make sure that children learn what they need to know. We must give them the confidence that they will be able to create a good future for themselves. And thirdly, we must provide everyone with a quality education. We need to harness the potential offered by technology. We need to f the future generations who can learn the digital revolution, who can lead the digital revolution, and who are able to use and create new technologies. And having said this, technology may benefit some people and not others. We therefore need inclusive technologies. We need platforms and products that are accessible for all. And Norway lead the development of a global digi uh, digital library that provides free reading materials in over 30 languages. This library can also be used by people with visual impairments and is, includes assigned language videos. Everything may be changing around us, but let us remember that at least two things will remain the same. The human heart, and the importance of education. So I warmly welcome this initiative by UNESCO to better prepare us for the future of education. And thank you, and I'm sorry to say I'm doing something now that I hate to do, leave the panel, because I have three minutes to, to, to give another, another speech. Panel. Yes, <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, I would like to give the floor now to His Excellency, Mr. Xavier Expot, Prime Minister of Andorra. Mrs. Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to first uh, congratulate all the people that are at the origin of this ambitious project. I wish to salute the will of UNESCO through her general director, Mrs. Audre Azoulay, to not give up in her engagement uh, toward education. The era of digitalization is already a research that has transformed the life of millions of people in the world at a very fast speed. But the stakes and challenges of AI are in multiple. It needs to be at the service of people and uh, present without doubt uh, enormous uh, opportunities for humanity. How, unfortunately, in this uh, futurist context, a child out of five around the world is still not uh, attending school, a number that hasn't evolved in the last five years. On the other hand, uh, on the, the disparities 
uh, between the rate of uh, children in the poorest countries and the children in the richest country is uh, becoming uh, larger today. We need to not only make efforts to ensure universal access to education, but also to uh, face a crisis of learning. The fact of going to school is not still uh, uh, enough to get a good quality education. So it is essential, even in the most difficult economical context, to insist on quality education with teachers who are trained and well paid and classes uh, that are uh, and small classes investment in education is an investment in the long term but which that is essential for a country's growth education needs also to offer technical uh, and professional uh, skills so uh, students can believe in a professional uh, future. The government ne governments need to ensure girls uh, quality education and access to higher education and vocational training. Agenda 2030 reminds that constantly. Uh, as long as half the people of humanity does not have the same opportunities, sustainable development will not happen. Uh, facing the increase of radicalization, xenophobia, intolerance, and lack of solidarity towards the uh, migratory catastrophes that are fed by the frustration of a population that feel uh, left out, uh, socially and economically, we need to re-examine the educational model in the world. Despite or thanks to this measure, Andor is engaged for an uh, educational system which is inclusive that allows everyone, even the most vulnerable, to uh, go to school. So uh, more than 90% uh, of the children of Andorra are go to the same school as the other children do. This inclusion, of which I gave an example, allows all children to build themselves in a context in the respect of uh, difference. Uh, also, since the, they're very young, the children in Andorra receive education on human rights, global citizenship, the fight against stereotypes and discrimination. That is the key. Uh, the key to uh, solidarity, uh, citizenship uh, for sustainable development on our planet. I am convinced that the project of the future of education is vital to redefine values, goals, and the skills that we need to give priority to for our children so that they can face the challenges of the future and so that they can work for a sustainable development. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup. All the speakers of the first part uh, for your inspiring words. And uh, we moved into the second portion of our program. I invite all of you to, to see this uh, short video for UNESCO to describe the initiative. Shame. Accelerated climate change, artificial intelligence and biotechnology, increasing exclusion and fragmentation. Our world is becoming more complex and uncertain with many disruptive challenges. Knowledge and learning are humanity's greatest renewable resources for responding to challenges and inventing alternatives. Yet, education doesn't only respond to a changing world. Education transforms the world. But to create the futures we want, we must rethink education. UNESCO has launched a global initiative to reimagine how knowledge and learning can shape the future of humanity and the planet. We are looking at 2050 and beyond, and we want to partner with you to discuss, debate, and re-envision the ways education enables us to become what we want to become. For ourselves, for each other, thinking together so we can act together. 
Join the conversation and let's make the futures we want. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Professor Aryun Padurai. He's a well-known, very well-known anthropologist, and uh, he's here today with us as a member of the International Commission, but more than this, to, to give uh, his perspective about imagination, right? And uh, aspiration, the futures of education. So, the floor is yours. Well, it's a very great honor to be here. I thank uh, the Dire Director General, the ADG, of whose work I've known. Uh, it's great to see the President of Portugal, who I've had the pleasure of meeting on a previous occasion, and to hear his uh, terrific, uh, acute, uh, and wise uh, remarks. Uh, so what I have to say may be considered something of a uh, extension or addition uh, to the many wise things that have already been said and shared, particularly by uh, the president, but also by the ADG, the chair, the other distinguished heads of state who spoke. So I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and uh, we all have seen uh, that the world, in the world that is emerging, our biggest challenges have no national boundaries. So global thinking is the need of the moment in uh, such areas as big data, climate, security, disease, migration, and arms control, to name some of the most visible. In our current moment, we need to recognize, and we all have already today, the importance of youth, both demographically and politically, uh, as we see, for example, in, in the recent protests around climate here and uh, the role of Greta Thunberg. Uh, we also, of course, need to recognize the rise of populism and the forms of political extremism that are now appearing in far too many parts of the world. Inequality remains persistent and pervasive around the world, advances in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and biotechnology, raise profound questions about what it means and will mean in the future to be human. The benefits of technological advances and innovation are indeed not being shared uh, around the planet in a just manner. And as uh, the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, uh, whom we just heard and others have powerfully argued here and elsewhere, the environmental and climate crisis are not just academic discussions about future sustainability, but are life and death uh, survival issues today. Education is indeed a vital resource in addressing all of these challenges and many others. And the broad goals uh, of the UN and UNESCO converge on the, a vision that brings together, and has long done so, democracy and development. But much thinking about development in the 20th century has not been driven by democratic goals. And this leads to what I want to propose. It has been based on the idea that knowledge, expertise, and goal setting have to be transferred from a small group of technocrats to a large group of recipients who lack the capacity to design their own futures. In recent times, this idea of expert-driven development has been challenged by ideas of participatory planning, local knowledge resources, and decentralized decision-making. But so far, as education is concerned, there is still, I would say, an emphasis on marketable skills rather than on imagination and anticipation. For the majority of the world's population, especially those in the poorer regions and countries of the world, the biggest obstacle uh, to achieving development is the weak, weak recognition of their capacity to define their own futures and to imagine the good life 
in their own terms. I have used the term the capacity to aspire for this capacity, which is poorly developed. When vulnerable communities imagine their own futures, they bring together their capacity to anticipate and their capacity to aspire. No human being nor any human community lacks these capacities, but poverty, insecurity, and institutionalized marginalization have not let them build these capacities. So a vital task for educators of all ages and sizes and shapes and colors will be to build the capacity of the young, the poor, and the marginal to imagine, to anticipate, and to aspire. There are many ways that these capacities could be built. Many of you are pursuing them as policymakers, activists, or teachers. And I want to add my own thoughts here in order to stir the pot and to enrich the mix of possibilities for our collaborative visions. So in my view, the most important and most scarce resource that we can provide as educators is the capacity to generate new knowledge. We generally think of the making of new knowledge as a monopoly of universities, and that too of the postgraduate scholars and faculty among them. These are the people we usually refer to as researchers, discoverers of new knowledge. We see research as a difficult, esoteric, and elite practice, which requires years of primary, secondary, and tertiary education. But I believe that we need to recognize the right to research as a human and as a universal right. Any literate adult should have the right and the means to produce new knowledge and to do so in a careful, systematic, and thorough manner. Why is it important to democratize the capacity to conduct research and to pr produce new knowledge locally without depending on the sphere of formal postgraduate education and training alone? The answer is the world's problems may be planetary, but the ways in which they affect specific cities, regions, and countries is intensely local. Democratizing the capacity to conduct research and to produce new knowledge requires a great deal of support from traditional funders, scholars, scientists, and planners. It indeed cannot be done by marginal populations on their own, but it is a vital capacity to develop among the younger citizens of our world, for they are in the eye of the storm, and they are the first to face the worst global problems, so we must empower them to be the first to generate solutions. It is an honor to be part of this new initiative on the futures of education, and I challenge us all to think deeply about the challenges and opportunities that we see now and on the horizon. And I invite us all to think about how we can enable people to aspire in their own terms, how we can enable people to build their own capacities, to imagine, to aspire, to anticipate, to advocate, and to intervene. Surely, this is how we shape these many futures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I will now uh, like to open the floor for additional statements from member states, starting from His Excellency, Mr. Nasser Burita, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation uh, of the Kingdom of Morocco. Ladies and gentlemen, heads of state and government, ma Madam uh, Executive Director, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, for me it's a great honor to be among you and to convey the greetings of His uh, Majesty Mohammed VI uh, and uh, for this m m meeting which is dealing with such a vital theme. We all share the conviction that education is the future, but we still have questions about the future of education. And there's nothing more legitimate than that. This questioning is healthy because questioning is the contrary of certitude, st stagnation, and self-satisfaction. It's living. It's curious. It's uh, eternally dissatisfied and searching for knowledge. So we need that for future generations so that each new generation can contribute something to the next. But 
we need to, to think about the education of today and by continually uh, ad adapting and preparing for the future. We're not here to predict the future of the education. I think we're here to m create the future of it. How? By making it uh, aligned with reality and uh, meeting uh, the education educational expectations that we have now. So this is a, a duty that's continually changing. The education of tomorrow w won't be the same as that of today or yesterday. So this change also demonstrates that the world is becoming more and more open. Physical boundaries are receding ever farther away. The linear conveyance of knowledge is a thing of the past, and we no, can no longer just depend on academic sources of knowledge. So uh, the new technologies that we're experiencing are no longer science fiction. So uh, it's no longer adaptive to have a unidirectional form of education. We need not. Uh, we need to uh, just because we have a multi-pronged uh, approach to education now doesn't mean that we are uprooted from our culture or our countries. But c c education is a part of humanity's heritage. It doesn't depend solely on identitarian backgrounds. It depends on the mobility of knowledge. The education of the future uh, cannot uh, deny the need to take into account these parameters. We need a universal and un non-discriminatory approach to education turned towards the future and the acquiring of s skills and that respect universal values. So if I were to summarize the mission of education for tomorrow, it would be to prepare, be prepared for change. Change is henceforth structural. And it must uh, integrate the functions of anticipation, adaptation to change, starting with the youngest generation. We must be prepared f to meet the challenges of ch climate change, and we're doing that during the 74th uh, GA. And I'm executive, executive general. I'm uh, wish to commend you for uh, setting up this uh, international commission, and we'd like to commend uh, also the uh, leaders of Ethiopia and Morocco. And, and thank you very much for taking part in this commission. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Mr. Uh, Ville Skinari, Minister for uh, Development Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. You can stay there if you prefer. Yes, just to. Sorry, it's really very late. Yeah. Mais, Madame et Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, it's a great pleasure to be here today and to address the the for me to address this important event on behalf of the uh, government of Finland. How do we best prepare our children and youth for the future? This is a key question to all countries. In the midst of global megatrends, UNESCO is well positioned to lead this discussion. And Finland fully supports UNESCO's efforts in the ambitious Futures of Education project. Finnish society hi highly values education. It has enabled Finland to rise from one of the poorest countries in the world and become one of the world's wealthiest countries in the 100 years of independence. By international standards, we have a reputation for having created a top-performing top system of comprehensive school, school education. I'm happy that the education system of Finland was also recently ranked as the most future-prone. By the end of 2020, the government will draw up a roadmap for skills and learning in 2030, aiming to increase the level of education and competence in Finland to increase equality in education and to reduce the differences in learning 
outcomes. The roadmap will examine the entire education system, from materni maternity clinics to the university level. In order to ensure a just and fair transition to carbon neutrality, we will combine investments in education and social welfare with an ambitious climate policy. We cannot develop education in isolation. We need to get out from silos. Environmental education is in the very core of Finland at all levels, starting from the kindergarten. On the global level, we should do better to combat the, the learning crisis, which hinders the prosperity of entire nations. Countries can only be as strong as their human capital. This is why the government of Finland has decided to raise the importance of education also in our development policy. The quality of the teachers is the key. Digitalization is the key to, to enable scalability at the global level. Therefore, it's highly alarming that more than half of children and youth worldwide are not learning the basics, whether they are in the school or not. Additionally, 750 million adults cannot read or write we must support teachers, improve their competencies and working conditions. Girls and women, as well as vulnerable groups, must remain at the forefront of all efforts. Through improved vo vocational education and training, we must provide future prospects for those hundreds of millions of young adults without a decent job. If women have the same access to the economy as men, the GDP of the world would be 26% higher. And the key entering the economy is education. Distinguished delegates, the issue of relevance of learning has never been as important as today. Education systems must fit to ensure the necessary competencies and skills for a sustainable way of life and work. Automatization, digitalization, and robotization will fundamentally affect entire industries and bring new skills needed, new skills needs. Providing continuous learning opportunities for reskilling and upskilling is increasingly important. I also wish to highlight that people worldwide need improved competencies and tools to critically confront the mis- and disinformation. We believe that not only digital skills, but also the so-called multiliteracy must be seen as a new civil skill. Finland supports UNESCO's efforts to prepare a global vision and strategy on liter literacy on the 21st century. I will conclude by using the words of our Prime Minister, Mr. Antti Rinne, according to whom the time for saying yes but is over. The clock is ticking. There is no time to waste. It is urgent to harness the full potential of the knowledge sector in our joint endeavor for a sustainable future. That is why increasing investments in the entire knowledge chain from early childhood education to higher education, science and innovation is one of the transform transformations we need to see globally. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Scandly. It's a big challenge to chair ministers, as former minister I can say, but I kindly ask you to be very, very short. So the next speaker is Minister of Finance of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Mr. Ken of Oriata. Please, less is more to be very, very short.
in your statement. Please take the floor. This one can. Thank you very much indeed, and um, I'm actually not quite sure why I'm here, except for the money that I may need to provide. Um, but I think Akosua um, put it, you know, really clearly to us uh, how to reimagine um, the future uh, of education and what UNESCO is doing. I guess it's looking towards 2050, um, and that's a significant um, year because in that year. Uh, Africa would have 20%, 25% of the world's population and the largest youth bulge. So we need to tackle that. Now, the future that we want, um, it's a confident um, planet, a confident people, um, people that have dignity, uh, independent thought, and productive. How are we teaching them? What is the current pedagogy that we are using? How do we get entrepreneurial skills and literally teach people to learn and to relearn because the society is changing so quickly? Technology must intervene for quality, access, inclusiveness, and, and, and equality. But the statistics are grim. Um, out of school children has increased 41% to 54% for Africa. There are three times more youth um, in Africa and Asia than China had in 1990 to transform that. And we have to deal with that. Education can't wait. There are some 700 million people who may become a lost generation if we do not tackle that now. And we cannot afford to leave anyone behind. Currently, if you look at World Bank statistics, it's about 12.2% of World Bank um, expenditure that goes to health, and 1.6% goes to education. There's something really fundamentally wrong. The global spend on education is about 4.7 trillion, um, of which 3 trillion, 65%, is by the developed world, and 0.5% um, from, um, from the LICs. That it's a problem, because we are also going to have most of the youth um, population for the future. So we need to do things differently. Um, Ghana, for example, I think we spend about 28% of our expenditure um, on education and um, about 6% of GDP. How much more can we go? With the president vision of free senior high school, is 290,000 people that have come into the fray and they have to be taken care of. Where do we get the resources from? So it's for this reading that we really applaud what Gordon Brown is trying to do, um, to bring in new resources uh, and change the way in which it is financed. Um, as chair of the development committee of the World Bank, uh, I pledge um, to support that, to find much more innovative ways of financing education uh, for the future of the continent. Thank you very much. of the Ivory Coast Republic of Africa. Very, very short statement, please. Merci, Madame la Directrice Générale. Thank you, Mrs. Director, for the organization of this panel and uh, for having invited us. And I thank all the, uh, everybody present. The proposed uh, subject is uh, is a very uh, present uh, subject today. You're asking us to think about the future of education, and you're perfectly right. We need to adapt. We need to adapt to the new context. And my contribution uh, uh, is about the challenges of African countries, and especially the countries of the sub-region to which I belong, uh, West Africa. We need to create motivation. We need to create motivation. We need to uh, uh, get the school to the learner. The difficulty in our states is that the child uh, needs to uh, go uh, do the tens of kilometers to go to school. So we need to create motivation. We need to make a school accessible to all children who are in age to go to school. And for young people, and especially for students, it's necessary to develop uh, 
to, de to develop education uh, by distance. We need to uh, make schools more attractive with uh, uh, ordinary classes, but also uh, in a, there should be, be in this last children. We need to revise the syllabi. And at Cote d'Ivoire today, we're teaching entrepreneurship at school in order to prepare children to their future life. We also need to teach uh, uh, the, about the human rights and the environment. We need to give prior priority to vocational education because one of the challenges is uh, the uh, unemployment of uh, young people. We need to prepare young people to uh, uh, skills uh, uh, according to the uh, needs of the national economy. We need to take into consideration the new employments. We need to take uh, into account digitalization and uh, uh, inclusivity uh, and uh, take uh, also into consideration gender, uh, develop uh, education of young girls, uh, take into account uh, children who live with a handicap as well as uh, take into consideration the social condition of children, uh, disadvantaged children. We also need to talk about nutrition. We know that nutrition during the first thousand days of a child has an enormous impact on uh, the child's growth and his or her intellect. And I will conclude about uh, talking about literacy of uh, children and adults in an innovative way. We work on that in uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire. We have uh, literacy centers in prisons, at marketplaces, etc. So since I need to be brief, I wish to say that the school of the future, the education of tomorrow that we wish to have uh, today needs to be uh, needs to adapt teaching to the present context as you described. Thank you very much. Over yeah. to the chair of the panel, Mr. Armand Dusset, and kindly ask you to really keep the time and uh, you know. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Giannini. Uh, Your Excellencies, Madame Azoulé, ladies and gentlemen, Mesdames et Messieurs, uh, it's an honor to be here today. I'd just like to quickly thank my school leaders uh, back home in New Brunswick for giving me the opportunity to come. Uh, we've come here for a very important conversation. I'm going to introduce the panel. Uh, first off, uh, to my left is Ms. Susan Hopgood, who is the President of Education International, a global federation of teacher trade unions that represents over 32 million education personnel from preschool all the way to university. Uh, she's also worked as a mathematics teacher in Australia. To her left is in bringing an important perspective from uh, philanthropy and also the private sector is Mr. Matias Rodriguez Incierte, a former minister and deputy secretary of state to the president of Spain. He now serves as the president of Santander University and the vice president of Universia. Also joining us on this discussion, as you see, are Mr. Robert Napier and Ms. Akosia Echapon, the impressive youth speakers that you guys saw uh, a bit earlier in the program. And to my immediate right here is Mr. Tristan Harris, who has worked with Google, with the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab, and is former CEO of Aperture. He's also a specialist on issues of ethics and technology, and is the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Human, Human, Human Technology. Uh, so we've just heard impassioned remarks from heads of states, ministers of education, uh, Professor Apadurai, and right now we're going to look at getting a response from the panel itself. So first off, I'd ask Mr. Harris to talk about the perspective from the world of technology. Thank you. I'll be very quick. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, my, my background, uh, I was a design ethicist at Google actually studying how do you ethically shape two billion people's thoughts when you control news feeds, smartphones, notifications, et cetera. And I bring this up because when we talk about education, what is educating your nervous system on a daily basis? Your smartphone. And 2.8 billion people, more than the size of Christianity, are jacked into Facebook for uh, hours, in the Facebook ecosystem for hours a day. More than 2.3 billion people use YouTube for more than 60 minutes a day. In developing countries, it's hours and hours. And so no matter what kind of education we provide, the technology companies that, whose business model is strip mining human attention and automating what thoughts and, and where attention goes 
are controlling and shaping the cultures, the education, and the beliefs of populations, which is actually fueling some of the rise of populism, extremism, and conspiracy theories. And I just want to bring that perspective because I think it's really important to acknowledge, no matter what amazing kinds of education initiatives that people in this room enact, uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, there are uh, you know, trillion dollar companies whose business model is to automate what we show people. And a couple quick stats, you know, YouTube has recommended flat earth conspiracy theories hundreds of millions of times. So if you wonder why your students believe in flat earth, uh, that the earth is flat and not round, that might be why. Uh, Anti-vaccine conspiracy theories are fueled on Facebook and on, and on YouTube. Climate denial actually outcompetes uh, the scientific consensus as recommended by YouTube videos. So if you wonder why do not more people are alarmed by the climate crisis, it might be because YouTube might be recommending that. So I want to be very respectful of time, but just wanted to offer that perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, very interesting looking at ethical integration in education. Uh, we're now going to uh, go to Ms. Hopgood, who's going to talk about uh, the perspective of 32 million teachers. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, and good afternoon, er um, everyone, colleagues, friends, Your Excellencies, um, um, Madam Director General. Um, the, histori the historian William Durant called education the transmission of civilization. But we know, just to mangle his definition a little bit, that education is far more than the transmission. It's the engine and the chassis and the wheels of civilization. Those who have it race ahead of those who don't. Of course, in income, but also in the health of their children and the span of their lives and the ambitions of their grandchildren. When we talk about the future of education, it's critical for us to keep a sharp focus on the path, that path to the future, what it takes to position ourselves to leave our too often toxic and dangerous past behind. Education International had its, held its um, World Congress early in July this year. And we um, set our course for the next four years. And I want to share that very briefly with you because I think it's relevant to our discussion. We vowed to promote democracy, human and trade union rights, equity and social justice. We committed to continuing to advance our profession and reassert the role the vital role of teachers and other educators in education and society. And we promise to keep fighting for the SDGs. Goal four on education, yes, but also goal 13 on climate change and in every area of the battle for a sustainable future. Simply put, we want to change the world. I've been reflecting on this, this week, how this puts us in good company with many of us students who have come to this city and hundreds of other cities, towns and public squares to make the future a critical fact of today, right now. They know what we all know, that imagining the future is only a start. To get there in the right way, we need to think in the here and now of details and systems and power. In the union movement, we have a word for that. The word is organise. To have the future we imagine, we must organise. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hopgood. Uh, it's very parallel to everything that the ministers and the excellencies have said today in terms of teachers will be at the forefront in this revolution towards this vision of 2050 education. We'll now move to uh, Mr. Incierte. Madame Director General Azulay. Madam Director General, uh, and there is a great honor here today. Uh, we are very proud uh, to be a member uh, of this uh, uh, process in which we are going to review the main lines of education for the future. I think it's been underlined through the various interventions this uh, morning. This is a, it's a very interesting initiative, and uh, we think that uh, UNESCO was one uh, more uh, right in addressing this issue in a very timely fashion. We all recognize that the problems of the world in which uh, inequality, uh, the problems with uh, diversity, the problems with climate change are uh, uh, more present than ever. There is a dramatic transformation in the uh, digital revolution and all these things require a new vision, a new thinking about education. What Santander can bring to the table in this debate? 
as a private institution, we have dedicated a lot of efforts over the last 20 years in helping higher education. We have uh, reached agreements with over 1,200 uh, universities all over the world, and uh, we have dedicated to education over 1.7 billion euros over this uh, uh, time uh, period. Uh, we are uh, strongly committed to uh, maintaining a, a goal of uh, helping uh, higher education as being uh, recognized uh, by, for example, a meeting that we had uh, last year in Salamanca, in, attended by uh, more than 700 chairs of universities all over the world, representing more than 20 uh, uh, countries, in which, by the way, the president of Portugal was present, in which we identified these universities identified the main themes going forward in terms of uh, education. We are uh, committed with all uh, these goals. As an example of uh, this commitment, is, uh, 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 we are about to uh, develop uh, uh, scholarships and to help uh, 200,000 scholarships over the next uh, three years. We think that equality and given equal opportunities to young students is one of the foremost concerns of the world today. So by uh, pro uh, promoting from the private uh, sector uh, this kind of uh, uh, help, we think that we are giving an example to other companies how the private sector can cooperate in this uh, means of education. So thank you to UNESCO for having invited us to participate in this uh, pro uh, program. We are very proud and we think that we can bring to the table this potential cooperation between the private and, and public sectors and bring also to the table the relationship with the universities we have developed over uh, 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you for those words. Uh, Merci de cette intervention. Maintenant, nous allons to finalize this summary. Okay. So quickly, just two thoughts. So first, from the private sector to the public sector, from technology to educators, there are different actors within this space that need to collaborate and partner to ensure the reimagination of education. It's that there are also family units, community leaders, traditional leaders within different contexts that can also be partners um, in this journey towards um, education for all. And lastly, that reimagination of the futures of, educa of education does not necessarily mean a reinvention of it. There have been so many best practices that have been shared right here, right now, that we can begin to take examples from and take back to our homes and hone them for the context that um, we are in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Napier. Thank you very much. I'll also be very brief. I think that from the discussions, we can all analyze that this initiative is something that is extremely necessary and important. However, I think that there is one thing that we really need to emphasize, and that is times are changing, and with these changing times, we need to be innovative in the methods that we are using both for teaching and for learning. And one of the most crucial aspects that we need to admit to ourselves is understanding what we don't know. Because as a friend of mine once said, if you don't know what you don't know, how can you know what to go learn? Thank you very much. Thank you. A uh, quick summary and closing comments. Uh, what I really liked about this session today is that we are looking at the quality of the teacher as the most important thing to push this forward. Uh, particularly, uh, the Minister of Education in Finland talked about uh, supporting teachers and to make sure that the silos were brought down and that we can work together as we move forward. Uh, so I thought that was really impressive and really interesting to see as we are trying to reach this vision of education for 2050. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, a brilliant discussion, a lot of inspiring points. Uh, thank you all the panelists, uh, all the heads of state, all, all of you, you know, is there for a long time. Uh, just mentioning that we have uh, uh, two mechanisms to build the process, the International Commission and the Advisory Board. You can find all information on the website and also in the brochure that is in, in, your, uh, in this room. And uh, so, Thanks a lot. Uh, looking forward uh, to the future 
with a lot of hope, determination, and passion. And it's not about reinventing, as you say, it's about uh, rethinking, and it's about uh, giving a chance to all children in the world to have uh, their own opportunity to find their own place in the future society. Thanks, and it's a bit ambitious. Thanks to my boss to, to giving us the opportunity to, to build this process.